Welcome in, everyone. Welcome to the Buddhist Wisdom Podcast. Uh, today, I have the pleasure of uh, speaking with Susan Kaiser Greenland. Welcome, Susan. Um, I'm going to read uh, Susan's bio quickly. So if, if those of you who aren't aware of her, you can get to know her a little bit. And then we're going to, you know, dive into the Dharma, dive into uh, practice and, and also dive into uh, Susan's new book. Um, we'll be talking about that as well. So Susan Kaiser Greenland is a mindfulness educator and best-selling author, specializing in distilling global wisdom traditions and scientific research into straightforward everyday practices. In the early 2000s, she helped pioneer the introduction of secular mindfulness into classrooms through her inner kids model. After decades of working with children and adults um, and writing two widely translated books, uh, Susan's latest work has culminated in a new book called Real World Enlightenment. Uh, her work has been featured in the New York Times, the Los Angeles Times, USA Today, and CNN. So yeah, Susan. Thanks so much for uh, taking the time to talk with us. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. I was really looking forward to this podcast. Cool. Me too. My peeps. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And it's been a minute. We were just talking about that. It's been a minute since we've seen each other too. So yeah. 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 Nice to connect. Um, so, you know, just to, just to kick us off a little bit and also before we get into your new book, uh, real world enlightenment, um, you know, just for the audience who's not super familiar uh, with your work, just just a little bit about your work, because I mean, you work you work a lot in in the realm of mindfulness and kids, as your bio said. So, so just anything on that you'd like to share to just kick us off here. Yeah, I started working developing you know mindful games, activity based mindfulness or awareness based mindfulness for kids and families way back, like in around two thousand. And my first book was published in 2010. It was called The Mindful Child. Uh, so up till that, then it had been 10 years of working almost exclusively with kids in schools and in after school settings at boys and girls clubs, that kind of thing. Mm. But after that first book was published, then all of a sudden I started getting these fabulous invitations to teach adults how to teach mindfulness to kids. So since then, I've done some work with kids and continue to develop some activity based uh, awareness exercises for them. But most of my work has been with adults, but in the family space. So clinicians, uh, educators and parents. And that's been the last 20 years. And that's been fantastic because the number of grownups that I have met over the years who tried to practice meditation just couldn't, couldn't land. They couldn't find a place that they could really hook in. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the adult practices, when they started doing the kids' activities with their kids, those simple 30 seconds at a time, brief moments of awareness, and often involving movement or something, they they got a feel for it. And it really shifted their experience of practice. Yeah, that's wonderful. I'm, I'm thinking of my daughter, who's a year and seven months right now. I'm thinking, oh, okay, I need Susan's books. <laughs> I need some of these mindful <laughs> games <laughs> when she's I ready. I send them to Okay. Yeah, that'd be great. Yeah. Um, one quick question before we we move a little bit more into your current book is, um, you know, how have you, because you, 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 I would call you, you know, an OG in mindfulness, if you're okay with that <laughs> term. Um, what, how have you kind of seen the landscape change? And I mean, I, it's a big question, but just anything that pops into mind around them. It's, it's, you, they, they really, you can't really, um, compare them anymore. You know, when I started out, we had to be very careful about the word mindfulness. Mm. You know, the first program I did, we would go out in the back of the school is bed gardening and sneak a little breathing in there. And that was about the best we could do. I remember getting in heated conversations with parents or teachers in the hallway. Uh, it was very different universe uh, as far as mindfulness and meditation in schools. We've come a long way. Uh, that is the really good news. Mm -hmm. The unfortunate news is that it's so much of this has gotten watered down. And also, there really is often a sense that mindfulness is just about breathing. It's just about calming, or it's just maybe maybe a little mindful listening. You know, you ring a bell, you raise your hand, but there's nothing more to it. 
Mm. As a result of that, kids get bored and teachers get bored. And right now, clinicians in Los Angeles, where I am right now, will tell me they have teenagers coming in who have had mindfulness in their more progressive schools since they were elementary school. And the teenagers will say, hey, anything but mindfulness. I'm not breathing. Nothing like that. I've kind of had it. So Mm -hmm. that is a big shift. And so we, um, for those of us who have a more practice background, we understand that the mindfulness-based calming activities are kind of a way in, that we do need mindfulness first to help us regulate and calm the nervous system. But once we kind of grounded, we can open up to those heart opening and those mind opening practices. But that's that's also one of the reasons I really wanted to write this book, because this book deals with golden threads or universal themes that cut across wisdom traditions that really are those universal themes like interconnection, multiplicity, uh, change, that sort of thing. Yeah. So so this so so uh, your new book, Real World Alignment, was I mean, obviously it's inspired by all your work, but it was inspired by by this issue in particular, I'm hearing, like this issue of watered down mindfulness and there not being a bridge to something a little bit more with more um, depth, I guess. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been writing about these universal themes or key concepts since since 2010, since The Mindful yeah. Child. So this was like the last book to kind of cap that up. But it clear it was clear to me we needed to dig deeper into that because, um, you know, mindfulness alone as a stress reduction strategy is very limiting. And when used in schools or by teachers or people in somewhat authority positions, it it actually kind of gets turned on its head and it's more of a controlling mechanism mm. than it is an awareness and an opening, uh, you know, sort of practice. So, um, yeah, it was important to me that I kind of try to get this out there in the world if somebody wants to read it. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah, the little the little exposure I've had to meditation and mindfulness education for youth. Uh it's not really where my work focuses, but I've done a little bit of that. Mm-hmm. Um yeah, I noticed a lot of the things you're describing and also um uh often there's a lack of um uh, uh education and training for the teachers. So mm-hmm. it's it sort of Don't that's where started. I was. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Don't get me started on that one. Yeah. Yeah, and of course, it's not the teacher's fault. It's often kind of how how much time is allocated and they're paid for for that and all, you know, all of that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the teachers are in terrible positions because they are, they have very, they have parents who are asking a lot of them. They have administration that's asking a lot of them. And then they have what they really were drawn to do, which is classroom time with the kids. So, mm. you know, teachers are heroes, man. They are total yeah. superheroes. Uh, but the problem of training the teachers, it really doesn't fall on the teachers. It falls on the system around it to support them. And um, again, you know, mindfulness isn't like teaching kids. Mindfulness isn't like teaching kids the piano or the French horn or the flute or something. You know, you can get a teacher to come in from the outside. You can be in the kitchen while they have their lessons and they, the, the child can learn to play a musical instrument and you really don't have to be involved. But mindfulness and awareness and attention, balance, compassion, that really has to be a system-wide practice, starting mm. with the parents themselves, the teachers themselves, the administration, the, the cafeteria workers. And that's a, that's a shift in, in mindset and a shift in worldview. Yeah, I agree. And, and you know, is there any kind of, and, and of course, if you, want to start to connect this to your book it's fine um or or we can go into that in a minute is um kind of what do you see as the future i mean you're already describing some needs you know what what's needed uh, some some more systems work in order to make it more um efficacious i guess uh, mindfulness Mm -hmm. in schools but what do you see the future of it being if you know if we're looking optimistically i guess (laughs) i think we can look at it optimistically because now you know the 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 huge resistance has broken down. Mm. So now it's just a matter of broadening and deepening. And I think being a little bit more realistic, I mean, 
It's also very much just my view, Scott. You know, I was never one to, you know, want to scale hugely. I remember early mindfulness in kids' meetings, you know, people saying, I want mindfulness in every school. What do you want to do, Susan? I said, well, I want to work on the practices and I want to get them right, you know. (laughs) And so I just am much a much bigger belief that individual transformation comes in small packages, comes Mm. in like handmade work. And there are plenty of people out there in schools and in family systems work who are really interested in this. And it's exciting because there are, um, there are a bunch of other organizations that are interested in going deeper uh, that are Buddhist organizations. And I expect that what will happen with that is that the material and the development that comes out of the Buddhist organizations that takes things deeper will then ripple out and become secularized. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, it's a long game, but you know, practice always is. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. And I like what you said. Um I said this word bespoke kind of became popular again. So I, you know, I haven't described my work as that. It's sort of like bespoke uh, mentoring or or sort of support for people's practice because I work a lot with individuals. And um, I, I agree with you. I think this because it happens in in Buddhism too. Where often I notice I can get caught in conversations with other teachers about like how do we reach more people? How do we bring more people to the Dharma Center? And I just started to think up over time. It's like, well, how does that, it would be great if more people had access to tools for, for working with their emotions and mind and, and of course, awakening and all that. But um, how do, you know, why do we define success by the amount rather than the quality, you know? So I, I think it's this spillover of, of um, I don't know, um, maybe I'm, you know, late stage American capitalism. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm not against capitalism, but, you know, I think the measure of everything in quantity sort of starts to skew our perception of, of benefit, I guess. I don't know. you have any thoughts on that? Or? Well, I agree. I think I think we need both. You know, there yes. also my experience in also I'm promoting a book now, so I see it there, too. The person who writes a book is not likely to be the best person to do all the promotion for it. Mm-hmm. And similarly, the person who is a practitioner who's d- deeply drawn to, to this work through the idea of transformation and freedom is not likely to be the person who's going to make the best website or who's going to mm. like do the best as far as promotion. I mean, those two things don't necessarily yeah. go together. And uh, so it's great that there are people out there, you know, reaching many, many people and scaling. Uh, but it's not enough. You need to also have the ballast and you need to have the people. And we see this in adult meditation too. And we see this with our teachers. You know, you need people who are steeped in practice and where you can actually feel it when you're in conversation with them or around it, because that, that sense of being near somebody uh, who embodies this way of being, that is what gives people hope that it's something that they can do too. And gives them a sense that, oh, this there is something a little different going on here. I'm, this person may not be perfect. I don't quite understand it, but there is something a little different going on here. Totally. I'm really glad you brought that in because <laughs> that's the part when I'm teaching uh, people newer to Buddhism it's really, you know, especially when they're very, um, I just call it um, scientific minded or materialist minded, it's very difficult to describe something. And it's actually much harder to describe something rather than just encountering a human being who's really transformed themselves. And you don't need a lot of words. You just, yeah, right. You're just around the person. Yeah. Yeah. And you, and people pick up the difference in energy and they pick up very quickly the difference in reactivity. And yeah. uh, and not just the level of reactivity, but the ways in which one responds, and those things those things stick. Yeah, they really do. Yeah, and I think you and I love to go into your practice back in a, in a bit, but you and I have been really fortunate to meet these kinds of people, and um, yeah, and, and there, it's that's what struck me. I just I really focus now not on what they. I mean, of course, I listen to what they say and I try to contemplate it. But it's a lot about how they are and soaking yeah. that in, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah, me too. Yeah, and we we share some teachers, and yeah. we I feel very fortunate. Yeah, me too. Um, so, so if you can kind of inter- you you already have been obviously, but just introduce us to your book, A uh, Real World Enlightenment, and um, 
I mean, there's also um, a subtitle, right? Uh, I'm forgetting it, but it's uh, around ordinary yeah, finding magic. ordinary magic in everyday life, and the ordinary magic reference is familiar to those familiar with Tibetan Buddhism, and yeah. uh, you know, it's it's just exactly that. It's the idea, and this is very much coming from uh, our shared teachers. I think you're also a student of Mingyur Rinpoche, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah so Sokni and Rim, two be- two beautiful brothers, Sokni mm-hmm. and Mingy Rinpoche, and um and their interpretation of the Buddhist teachings and the way that they teach it. And the idea is generally that we have, you know, it's about basic goodness or essential goodness. We already have what we need inside us to be happy and to be free. But the problem is, is we get in our own way, right? So when we get in our own way, we can't really tap into those golden threads or those innate human qualities of what I call attention, balance, compassion, and playfulness, what mm-hmm. Mingyur Rinpoche calls awareness, love, and compassion, and wisdom. But there are innate human qualities inside all of us that do make up this basic goodness. And so different traditions, even among Buddhist traditions, different traditions view it a little differently. Some be- believe that there are seeds of goodness inside of us and those seeds grow. Other traditions believe that the goodness is fully formed inside us. We just need to tap into it. But there's always a developmental piece, whether it's the seeds that need to go grow, and that's not just in Buddhism, that's also in other wisdom traditions, or whether it's already inside us and we need to tap into it, also in several wisdom traditions. The developmental piece is we have to either build our capacity to tap into it, or we have to build the qualities themselves. So there's always a developmental piece, and that's where practice comes in, practice both in a formal way and in an informal way. So I tried to I tried to expand on that because those, those innate qualities that are inside of us that are part of our basic goodness, out of those spring many, many other themes or, or human qualities or themes of just the way the world actually works. And so the book is set up to look at uh, maybe around 50 of those themes. Mm, And each chapter has a couple of them, like renunciation, allowing, um, safety, those kind of things. And then at the end of each chapter, there's a wrap-up section where there's a paragraph or so describing the theme, and then there's a short practice, and then there's a takeaway. And this Mm. interplay between practice and takeaway has been very pivotal in my life and maybe more so because of my work with kids and busy families, busy adults, Mm -hmm. that a lot of people are motivated for the more formal practice but don't have time. But there's a lot you can do by just dropping brief moments of awareness in with a prompt throughout the day and prompts things like, what do I need to feel safe or what am I, what, what's my motivation for doing this actual thing, that kind of thing. So the end of each chapter has one of those takeaways. Wonderful. So I know a lot of people don't have time to read books. And so what I'm hoping is that if I hope people do read the book and there's a fabulous reader on Audible who's reading it. But if you're like me and don't have a lot of time, you can just look at the back of mm-hmm. each chapter Look at the wrap up, see if it resonates with you. And if it does, you can play around with the practice and take away and then go back and actually read the chapter to get a little bit more depth. So that's how I um, designed it very much in keeping with the way that I have worked with kids and adults in schools and family systems. I always give them little cards that kind of explain what we're doing because people just don't have a lot of time. Yeah, I love that. I love that approach because I, I'm just imagining that, like going to the end of a chapter, seeing, oh, you know, when something resonates, you know, as you know, as uh, probably you're the same, you know, we, when something resonates with us and we're inspired by it, it, it's actually not hard to do a lot of reading on something. I mean, we just need the time, but we're inspired and we're going to make time for that. So I love that approach that once someone gets inspired by a certain chapter, by the practices, then they can, they can actually read the entire chapter if they want. Yeah. 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 That's very cool. Um, Yeah. And I've noticed this kind of uh, approach and maybe it's just, just the shift of the culture for where people, most of us are just more busy. We don't have time to read. I've noticed uh, people writing more books that are um, not only practical in nature, but kind of, um, 
have this approach, not necessarily exactly what you were describing, but something like that, where there's kind of like, you know, a little more clear oriented to bullet points, things like that, because we just, we become those kinds of readers, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, our, we're being, our brains are being trained by these things, these phones, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. Well, thank you for adjusting <laughs> and, and, you know, not only adjusting, but you're, it sounds like, I mean, you're really trying to attune to how people are, especially kids and the parents who, who are, you know, raising them. Yeah. yeah. Well, I don't know about you, Scott, but I know for me, you know, it took me a few years and I've been practicing for decades now, you know, I told you I'm pretty close to 70 now, but uh, it took me quite a while to get the mindfulness-based stress reduction piece down. So mm -hmm. that, that took plenty of work, but once it was and then that was fabulous that I was able to better regulate myself. I mean, that was life changing. But what really moved me more towards some, some level of freedom were these universal themes, mm -hmm. really starting to understand a little more about renunciation or a little un understanding a little more about the interplay between multiplicity, interdependence, and change. That's yeah. where I started to see myself and the world around me a little differently. And that's when those real changes started to happen. They couldn't have happened if I was all all jazzed up with my nervous system. So I needed those awareness-based strategies first. But then but then I was open to this other stuff. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. And I'd love to go into that with you because I I think, you know, probably we have a similar um uh I guess it's not really a challenge. It's like a a task, but like something I really love being tasked with, which is making these things relatable to people and not watering them down, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like both, uh, you know, as you mentioned, renunciation, uh, multiplicity, interdependence, you know, uh, impermanence. So, so I'm just really curious, um, you know, for you, what's alive in that? And, and obviously it's in the book, but mm -hmm. um, yeah, just how would you describe that in, in both your own practice and to kind of these, the readers that you're, you know, basically the people who would read your book. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think what's really alive in me for it is that I see that it does change people mm. I, and not just me and not just practitioners, you know, not just formal, you know, I'm sure, well, maybe not people listening to this podcast, but I'm sure there are people out there who, if they knew how much time you and I had spent sitting on cushions would think we were insane, you know? <laughs> uh, so there's not a lot of people who are, who are willing or interested in doing that. Uh, so the idea that if you just get some of these awareness-based stress reduction strategies down first, mm -hmm. which I still need today. I mean, I'm still using those, like if I'm caught in a line at the DMV, you know, so they are, they don't, their usage and their need doesn't go away. But once you get those down, really changing how you view the world that's looking at these things. Really stop seeing things as so solid, as so mm -hmm. fixed. You know, the day that I really became comfortable with my limitations in human knowledge was a tremendous relief. Just a tremendous relief, you know, <laughs> instead of fighting against it, try what's going on, figure that out, because I was that kind of person. Just yeah. like, okay, I'm going to do my best, but honestly... If that dog and cat can hear things and see things I can't see, there's got to be stuff going on out there that it just beyond my capacity. And yeah. so really developing, and that's where the playfulness comes in. With that comes a lightness and a sense of humor. And we're lucky again with our teachers because that's what you start seeing with these teachers who really have developed practices is you know, there's some serious stuff going on, but there's also a level of lightness and playfulness to it that it's just a fabulous quality and it really helps you get along. Yeah, yeah. I think um, I remember Sonia Mshay talking, I mean, he says many things about playfulness, but one just image that popped into mind is sort of like um, the idea of like nothing sticking. You know, when when you see people who, you know, I'm still cooking, so I'm not talking about me. But, you know, you see people like Mingram Shea, Sonim Shea, people of that caliber of practitioner. Uh, they, yeah, you don't see a lot of things sticking. <laughs> you know, like, right. you know, whether it's an emotion, a thought, a, a certain conversation that we might think, wow, that was kind of heavy conversation. It just doesn't, there's nowhere for it to stick, yet there's warmth. And I think 
those two things are are difficult for people to you know who, who are still practicing or you know working on or, or new to Buddhism or whatever that th- those things can come together the playfulness and the openness yet there's yeah. warmth there's not coldness you know? yes. Absolutely. And I think the playfulness actually brings that warmth and a little bit of a sense of humor about ourselves. And we stop taking ourselves so seriously, which also goes a long way. And not like, you know, like you, I'm still cooking. I mean, you know, I got stuck on something in the kitchen with my husband last night uh, and it did stick for a little while. But what happens is it doesn't stick for as long. You know, that's Mm. the, that you start to see these progressions from it used to be you'd wake up in the morning and it was still stuck. And then it's a little mm. bit less. And now it's like, okay, yeah, you kind of feel a sting, but it does start to change. And when you see that, and if you're in a community of people who can help you see that, if you don't see it yourself, that's where real transformation starts happening. Yeah. And I, and you know, you, you mentioned the word community. And I think, I think about this word a lot um, in many different contexts, also in cultural contexts, because mostly I live in Latin America. So I see community and family in a different way here than mm-hmm. how I see it in, let's say, the United States. Um, but uh, I think for a lot of us, our communities are family. And so, it, you know, I'm, I'm just curious there. Um, do you think of it that way or, or how, you know, some of the things we're, we're describing? Because it's like, that's where I get most activated. That's where, you know, yeah. The strongest things come up. So it feels like that's the richest ground for practice, you know. The family, absolutely. Yeah. But also I see the systems, especially with kids, you know, once you get into the school systems, okay, yeah. And I don't I, the system of the school, which is the parents and the teachers and the yeah. kids, and you know, you've got all of these different relationships forming. You've got the kids forming relationships with each other, you've got the parents forming relationships, you've got the teachers, you've got the administration. It's very much like a family. Mm. And so I see it in there too. But though, and I think the workplace as well, any place that you spend a lot of time is going to be a little bit of a pressure cooker when it comes to thoughts and emotions and big feelings. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And, and, sta- and, and when there's stakes, when you feel when there's the stakes. stakes. Yeah, that's an interesting one. I mean, what are stakes? <laughs> I guess I think there could be a whole, you know, investigation yeah. into that what do they what does that mean for you stakes well i think it fits really closely with what you and i were talking about earlier how the stakes shift and mm. certainly the stakes start to shift with practice um you know in in the united states and other you know sort of economic forward leaning places stakes are often things like that are financially related or some kind of success related. But then remembering that that success is so closely tied to our own personal identity, often it has nothing to do with really outside success. It's just how we are identifying with it, which again, identity is one of the themes that we take looking take a look at, which is kind of a pathway to understanding a little bit less of an ego, a little bit more of a healthy, more relaxed, more open type of an yeah. ego. So identity is a piece where stakes really fit in. And then, of course, with kids, stakes feel very, very high when it comes to your kids. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. You mean from the parent side or, or from both sides? I mean, obviously, from, yeah, from the parent yeah. side. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah, I, I, my little daughter, she's, I mean, obviously, the younger the kids, they tend to be more spontaneous and kind of, yeah. you know, uncontrived. I don't feel the stakes for that. I mean, I feel the stakes are high for her because we can see the the progression. And if yeah. the right nurturing doesn't happen, yeah. what can happen to an adult? But um, but I don't know if she sees the stakes. Not, you know? I don't think at that age, <laughs> yeah. you know, a little later, a lot later. Yes. But at that yeah. age, I don't think so. But for parents, and again, you're talking about identity, parents so closely identify with their kids. And mm. so again, it gets really mixed up where What what is an identity issue and what is a genuine, you know, cause for concern? And again, that's where these wonderful themes and practices that help us stop looking at things so tightly and Mm. start to tease them apart and see that, oh, it's really made up of many, many different elements that are always changing and they're all interdependent. And it's not a linear thing. It's more of a web. And 
there's just like a thousand points of light out there that are all connected and changing and interdependent. That helps us start to broaden our perspective and take this sense that something is, the stakes are so high and start to relax it a little bit. Yeah, I found that to be the case as well. And But I mean, on a personal level, I've found that it takes time, like, because, it, the, the, you know, that solidification is very, I'm not saying I've de- de-solidified it, not by any means, but it's, it loosens over time as we yeah. play with interdependence and we start to think this way and, and mm-hmm. we start to see the benefits of that, but, but it does take some time. And I think, I mean, that's why I'm really curious how, because c- the everyday part here, I'm curious how you're approaching it. Um, you know, maybe you can share some of the you know, some of the exercises with us if you want, or, 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 you know, whatever you feel called to do, but yeah, I'm curious. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a a good, a good thing, you know, one of the things is certainly the book, you know, you can take a look at the book, but honestly, when you start to practice, this stuff starts to emerge. It's one Mm -hmm. of the things that I have found with training facilitators over the years, it just doesn't make sense to me to give them a curriculum that they have to do Monday. It's this Tuesday. It's that it makes more sense to give them a sense of what the themes are, give them a sense of what the different methods are. And then what happens is on the ground, things start coming up. So for example, this whole idea of things being so stuck, you -hmm. know, one of the things that we see is just, it's a very polarized environment that we're living in now and it's very easy to just think that guy is wrong that idea is bad that is scary Mm. and all of that may be true i'm not denying that there aren't things that are you know one thing or another but what i am saying is that what really helps is if instead of getting stuck in that tightness we loosen up and think okay I don't have to agree with him, but what are a couple of things that I can think about that might be a little bit different? What are some causes and conditions that could have happened that could have made this this opinion as solid as it is that this other person has? Or what are a couple of things that might, if I knew, might change my perspective? And Mm -hmm. not that any of those things are true because it's all happening in our own minds, but it starts Oh, reminding us of the possibility and of the fact of everything is the result of multiple causes and conditions that came long before. And there it's, it's never quite as clear as it seems. And that again goes to this wonderful sense of not knowing. It doesn't mean that you give up. It doesn't mean you let go of your convictions. It just means you're a little more humble intellectually. So yeah. one of those things, when you really see something that you feel you're really stuck on, see if you can pick it apart a little bit. See if you can find different uh, pieces. See if you can find different potential perspectives. See if you can think of different causes. And you don't have to take it any further than that. Just that yeah. simple thing of trying to it's, it's, I don't know if you've ever had, because I wear these necklaces uh, and mm-hmm. they get tangled up. They really get tangled up. And I have to take like a, a pin, you know, like from a bulletin <laughs> board and carefully like start to, to get the knots out because yeah. you can't do it with these big fingers. And it's like that. That's mm-hmm. what you're doing with your mind. You're just like very delicately taking apart all of the things that are so closely intertwined to figure out well there's this little piece there and maybe i was wrong about that and then we don't have to come to any conclusions and just let it go and go on about our day i love it and thank you for the very practical tool if i get a necklace tangled i would have never thought of that (laughs) yeah yeah you have to just take one of those uh (laughs) pins from a bulletin board it's very practical advice um yeah wonderful you know to me there's there's also you know I, i like to approach my life as much as possible. And, and of course, if, if someone's, uh, if I'm supporting someone in their practice or life, I, I also mentioned this a lot, it's sort of like this idea of living from curiosity, which, which mm-hmm. it sounds aligned, uh, pretty much what you're talking about, you know, in the sense yeah. of like, how, you know, how, first of all, I think it's like, I like to make the case for living from curiosity. And then there's the practicality, which you so beautifully spoke about, you know, some ways to practically do that. I love that. I love that. I think curiosity curiosity is another one of the universal themes that is so important. Um, And what's great about things like curiosity, like kindness, these are themes that are not 
alone are not standalone Buddhist themes. They th- no. they cut across all of the wisdom traditions. So again, if you're thinking of focusing on commonalities instead of differences, if you can start focusing on those kind of agreements and start yeah. building bridges and relationships, then we're in a better position to navigate our differences. You know, and I'm not being touchy feely or airy fairy as if, you know, all we don't have problems and differences that are very difficult to solve. All I'm saying is that if we start with what we have in common and build some bridges, then when we get to trying to sort those things out, we're in a better position to be able to empathize. Yeah. And I think you're, you're also emphasizing, you know, I I think an approach, I don't teach too much secular approaches to meditation. I, I sort of stay more in the Buddhist realm, but of course I'm always trying to find bridges, which may be someone who's like, I don't know, Buddhist in a certain way might be like, oh, those bridges are secular, you know, even though I wouldn't call them secular. Um, but it, yeah. I, I really like the approach you just shared because I think that's, a, that's also, a, I think there needs to be a little bit of a reworking of what, how we approach something secular, right? Because as you shared in the beginning, there's, there's always this risk of watering something down to the point where it's 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 it might be effective. It just might be effective in something different than what <laughs> the Dharma is talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. sometimes the polar opposite of what the Dharma is talking about. Yeah, it's like just reinforcing the ego a little bit more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah because everything you're talking about to me, I mean, you're, you're talking about Buddhist principles, obviously, uh, but in your your own language and and, and through your work, um, it. Everything you said is is going to desolidify. You know, if one works on that, it's going to just desolidify this this construct of what, of who we think we are and who we think you know what we think the world is. Which I, I I mean, that can be a lift sometimes for people. I don't know if you find that to see that as useful, but I think mm-hmm. once, like I said, there's there's some someone seen that as useful. You know, it, it's it's very logical how that works. It's very practical. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it's it's also for people with absolutely no experience in Buddhism, it can sound yeah. scary. Yeah. So that's why coming in kind of in this manner, uh, then it's, you know, people feel that they need their ego. I mean, also a lot of a lot of uh my clients over the years who are successful professionally are terrified that they will lose their edge if they practice or that, you know mm-hmm. that kind of thing that they will no longer be able to be successful in their chosen profession when actually my experience in seeing so many people who practice is that the opposite is true there sometimes is a little bit of a rocky period but you know ultimately you know this more open minded open hearted way of being in the world it has a benefit to us and that ripples out to have a benefit to everybody around us. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you mentioned a, a, a you know, a key, a key, pretty core point, pretty key in the sense that it, it, it is a shift. Like I noticed that, you know, um, just in different things in my life, it's like we're shifting when we're in that, that in between state or Bardo between shifting our intention from one way of being to, to another way, which we don't exactly know how that feels or what that's like or how we're going to act. It is scary because that in between is sort of like, like we're losing this, this way we've worked and we're trying to let go of that and work a different way. Yeah. Yeah. And it can be a little messy. Um, yeah. And that's why it's so important to be working with a well-trained teacher. Mm-hmm. And it's also why it's so important to have a community of at least one or two other people around who kind of understand what's going on. Um yeah. Which goes back to what you were talking about earlier is the problem of, you know, teacher training. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and also just the way the industry is, I think, because, you know, um, it's sort of set up as we're set up as individuals and individually responsible for um, our income, our life, you know, livelihood income. Uh, I don't know, whatever thing we value in that where, yeah, I think. let's just just say spiritual teachers or teachers who taught in emotional and and healing practices or whatever uh, until very recently um, I think most humans worked in a different way they worked communally and they worked more as a a server Mm -hmm. and and if if someone's serving they're going to also have people serving their service you know what I mean yes yes and we've kind of lost that in the U.S. it it, it does exist a little bit elsewhere but Mm -hmm. let's just say modern culture we've lost that modern 
Yeah. No, we have lost. And I've seen so many people suffer from that. And it goes back to the person who is really doing this inner work themselves and who has, you know, great, you know, talent working with people like in this kind of this small piecemeal work that it takes to really make the connection and and stay with somebody those those that that is a that takes a lot of energy mm-hmm. and then to have to you know get off the zoom and like work on your website or bo- do your newsletter or figure out how best to you know promote the next event it's um it's 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 a little jangly yeah tell me about it <laughs> <laughs> yeah tell me, it, 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 yeah i mean the only way i know how to deal with it is to just treat it like really make it intentional and treat it like, okay, now I'm editing video. This is still mm-hmm. part of Dharma service, you know? Yes. Yes. And, and I have to like imagine the people uh, who might listen to or watch it. And, and I'm not saying I do that all the time, but at best, <laughs> you know, but I, but I found that to be the only way to connect. Otherwise it's very, like you said, jarring. Yeah. I'm totally with you. I've got to tell you, I, this idea of who is who is listening, you know, speaking to the person who is drawn to what the message is, has been a very, very powerful uh, eye opener for me of late, uh, because it's very easy to, and again, I think it goes back to our hardwired negativity bias, and we focus on what scares us, and so we try to get rid of the the risks. So because of that, it's very easy to focus on the people who, the haters or the people who don't really <laughs> like what you're doing. So it's it's much easier to focus on them and try to speak to them so that you want to convince them, right? You want, yeah, you yeah, want yeah. them to feel better and you want to take the risk away. Well, actually, that's really counterproductive. What makes yeah. sense <laughs> is to hold in mind that person who does open your newsletter every time you send it, who does come to the Zoom talks, who does come and sit with you. And remember, yeah. this is the person I'm speaking to. Yeah. And yeah. and mm-hmm. to learn a little bit more about who those people are and really just speak di- directly to them and let go of the rest because the rest is just noise. It really is. Yeah. Yeah. You, you Very well said. Yeah. Yeah. It took me a long time to learn that actually, you know, for me, because of the the way we as, as modern meditation teachers, we have to navigate. I, I I don't know. I mean, I think this idea of like the I mean, the, sorry, let me back up. Someone like a Minga Rinpoche or a Sonia Rinpoche, they're in a obviously they're in a different category of, of a teacher. So that's it's like that's its own thing. But they're also, um, you know, they're they're indigenous, you know, to Tibetan culture. And they, they actually, they're more embedded in their system. And so that's how they're functioning for the most part. And then they have Western, you know, organizations that then help them to interface with the West. Yeah. But um, I haven't, I mean, and they're quite fluid. I mean, as far as Tibetan indigenous teachers, they're very like interested in learning the, about the modern world and navigating it. And they're very skilled at it because of that. Cause they actually have an interest. It's like an, it's almost like a new language they've had to learn over 20, 30, 40 years. And they're very masterful at it. But nonetheless, the more I get to know them, you know, uh, especially Sonia it, Mshay, it's, he's still within a system, which is his birth system. It's what he was born into. He's born into the Tulku system and he's performing that role. Mm-hmm. And um, that's very different than a, a you know, someone uh, a modern western meditation teacher or, or buddhist teacher it's very different yeah we have to navigate a very different landscape but you know once i realized that um it it, it helped a lot because then i don't have to try to fit into a box it's more like oh what do i need to to like you said navigate all these roles and ways of interfacing with the world yeah yeah no i i'm totally with you i find it really it really has been a challenge and i've been watching it change just in the Oh gosh, however long, 30 years now that I've been, you know, moving in these circles. I mean, and also really resisting the outside pressure to be put into a box. Mm. Because all the outside pressure is, okay, are you a, you do this or you do that? You know, what is it? All all of that. And um, this work leads us to 
you know, breaking open all of those boxes and, you know, the creativity and the curiosity and the playfulness we're talking about and the effortlessness. I mean, these are qualities that are inherent to the practice that when we practice on the cushion and start to really feel them, we're able to take those off into real life. And when that happens, the boxes just don't make sense anymore and they don't really work anymore and that's very liberating and that's terrific although at the same time you got to figure out how to pay the rent you got to figure out how to get food on the table Mm -hmm. so it's not you know there are these practical things that have to be sorted yeah yeah and i think i think for you and i i'd love to hear kind of your experience with this because probably you get pinholed more into the secular department i'm imagining when actually as we're talking um I mean, you're much more embedded in, in traditional Buddhism than maybe someone might think on the on the on the surface, right? Yeah. Um, but um, how do you say it? I'm I'm yeah, I'm curious about uh, yeah, how you navigate that. I mean, you said a little bit, but but I'd like to hear well, more. Well, I it uh, what I you know when I talk about like the people having to focus on the people who actually do like my work as opposed yeah. to the people. <laughs> You know, where the criticisms often come is like, oh, she's too Buddhist or she's not Buddhist enough. You know, it's like one of those things. Yeah, totally. And, um, I get you that. know, I thought about this pretty seriously recently because I don't identify, I, I identify as a Buddhist practitioner. Yeah. I identify as a student. I identify as a teacher, but I don't identify as a Buddhist teacher. And mm. it's real, you know, I... I could do it if I had to, but it would be ugly if I had to right now tell you the 12 links of dependent origination. You know, (laughs) I just, I, that's not where I have spent my time, you know, studying and although, you know, I, I know about them. So it's like, I don't want to be in the position where I'm up on the, on the throne teaching (laughs) Buddhism because I honestly, I don't feel qualified in that, but application you know, I'm all over it. Application yeah. is my comfort zone. So that's how I deal with it. I just know who I am. Yeah. And um, and I'm really comfortable with that. And I am not, and I'm comfortable stretching that comfort zone in an area that makes sense with where I think I could be most service. But I am not, I'm not interested in going outside of that comfort zone to try to be something else um and that has helped but you know that took a long time to kind of figure out yeah that really resonates with me what you just said yeah i mean i I, i'm still figuring that out in the sense of you know i often do it now more from what we were talking about a few minutes ago (laughs) i just see who shows up and what their needs are Mm -hmm. and and then of course i have what i like to do Meaning, like, I tend not to work with beginner, beginner meditators. I tend not to be the best, Mm -hmm. you know, teacher for them, though I can do it. But I'm also Mm -hmm. not the best teacher for, like, people who are, like, want to go, you know, into the 12 links and all the, you know, I'm not, I'm not really interested in being a, like a, like a philosophy teacher, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So, 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 yeah, but what I find is, is probably you found the same as when we speak and we do our thing we 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 have the audience that that we can help and then of course we're we're dedicated to to the people who are showing up yeah yeah yeah, yeah. and that's that's plenty yeah it really is yeah yeah because what happens is you develop relationships with people and those relationships go on for years yeah yeah it's true so um, it's 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 a it's a it's a good it's it's i i think that's just really the sweet part and the other thing that's um great about you enjoying and being good at working with people in what some call the messy middle of practice yeah, is that the messy middle. <laughs> there's a lot of people who don't want anything to do with that there's a yeah. lot of people who just want to do the beginning or just want to do the advanced and that middle which tends to be a little bit messier um yeah. you know that's not what they that's not where their talent lies so i i think it's really something that you're providing that service Oh, I love the messy middle. Like, cause, cause I'm in the messy middle. <laughs> so I love it. It's yeah. just like, it's so rich. It's, I got like talking about, I mean, I have a lot to say about this, but I, I want to go back to your book in a second. Uh, so I'll say it briefly. Um, I feel like that's where all, I mean, I, again, this is personal, as you said, but uh, it's, it's personal to me. But I find like that's where all the, the, what the things you were describing before 
finding the, the nature of change more, you know, connecting with, with change, connecting with multiplicity and interdependence. It's in the messy middle because it's hard to identify as one thing when something is so messy and you're being curious about that, you know? Yeah. One advantage yeah. I find to it. I think that makes so much sense. Yeah. Um, so I do, I do have a question, which is, uh, okay. uh, which I prepared. <laughs> um <laughs> And it, it's kind of a big question, but it's meant to kind of just help us to open, you know, and for the listeners to open up more into your book, uh, although you've been you've been very generous in, in sharing a lot about it. You know, just based on the title, Real World Enlightenment, kind of the, the real world part where we've been talking quite a bit, and actually you've been talking about the enlightenment part, but this word enlightenment, um, I'm really curious, not only why you chose the word, because to those of, her, those of us who are Buddhist or Buddhist or Buddhist practitioners, however we want to define it, that's it's like not a surprise to use the word enlightenment. But I actually find the word enlightenment more and more of a mystery the more I practice personally. Yeah. So I'm just curious your relationship to that word, why you chose it, and and just any meaning you can bring out around your book as well. Well, I I was really I I started with freedom, yeah, and I thought that would be uh, in the title of the book, but. It felt like freedom. I think we need to reclaim the word freedom, frankly, but I don't think yeah. I have the I have the clout to do it with this book. Uh, but I think uh, freedom it means so many different things to so many different people in a very polarized world. That that's where I went to enlightenment. But I needed to modify the word enlightenment, yeah. and I needed, and so that's where the real world came in, real world enlightenment. But um, I I ended up falling in love with that title because. It, I think it dovetails really well with the idea of ordinary magic. You know, mm -hmm. why limit ourselves? This idea of enlightenment as being this lofty goal that is available just to a few who have spent lifetimes on the cushion. Um, not, not to, not to say that that doesn't exist and not to take yeah. anything away from that, but that is not available to the vast majority of us. But something is, and it's something that most of us have already experienced. You know, those glimpses where your ego drops away and you feel connected to something far greater than yourself. And the first time I made that connection on meditation retreat, where all of a sudden some dam broke and my shoulders lowered and I had this non-conceptual experience, was just, you know, a life-changing moment for me because mm -hmm. I realized I had had this experience before, and I had had this experience as young as childhood. You know, those experiences where you get out in nature, or I've had those experiences at the deathbed of my parent. I mean, they can be profoundly sad experiences or profoundly joyful experiences where just the ego drops. You feel connected to this, you know, thing that is vast and far greater, and there's no separation. And, mm. um, and that idea that Every, most of us, maybe everybody has had that experience, has had that glimpse, and that that's available and that with practice and with intention, we can extend those glimpses. That just is a real, that's just a very hopeful idea for me. And the same way ordinary yeah. magic, these simple little things happening in daily life, like a squirrel running across the branch or, you know, a sunset or something. Again, when you the, the first time, you know, your child says you know daddy or mommy or something that that is ordinary magic it's just those again those just moments that break free from kind of the workaday grind and mm. where you break out the ego just drops away it's an effortless experience so that's what i was trying to get across that it does exist and that you know we're not going to be able to um well, maybe some people can, but it's uh, it's hard to live that way 24-7, <laughs> and um, I certainly haven't come near it. But just by bringing awareness that it, I've had this experience before, that creates – it's like the Bader-Meinhof effect. You start seeing it. We start having it more and more often. And then when times are really tough – it's not that all of a sudden, like I'm joyful and kind of dizzy because I have this different headset, 
but I can tolerate difficult times a little better because I've tasted these moments of joy. I've tasted these moments of um, non-conceptual knowing, and I know that they're there. So I may not be in the place to be experiencing that now, but it gives me hope that on the other side, I'll be able to be there again. So that that's kind of what I was trying to get across in all different ways uh, throughout the book. Yeah, wonderful. No, and I think it's, I mean, I'm inspired that you, you, you know, because usually that's like a topic, what you're talking about is a topic reserved for like, you know, more, you know, we, or we, maybe I think it's a topic that's more reserved for meditators, like long-term meditators and are people really interested in, in, in the Dharma as a spiritual path or, or Buddhism mm-hmm. or some Indic, you know, Dharma tradition. Yeah. But, um, but as you're talking about it, it's something I I see more and more that I don't know the way the world is, something the way the times we're in. I'm not sure. A lot of people are very open to this. Um, yes. I mean, there's like there's like a psychedelic renaissance now as mm-hmm. well. So that of course that ushered in in the in the in the 60s and 70s, kind of the first wave of being open to these kinds of things. But but yeah, the more as you're speaking, I'm really seeing you know. I think there's room for this and, and not just not just for serious spiritual, you know, religious yes, people or whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. Like you said, the psychedelic renaissance, those are all seekers. You yeah. know, the whole world is full of seekers, people who are yearning for something. Now we know what our teachers would say. They'd say your true home is inside yourself and you yeah. can't find, you know, what you're yearning for outside of yourself. Uh and all of that is true, and all of the different practices and takeaways lead toward tapping into that true home inside ourselves. But the seeking is what people are doing throughout the country. And yeah. I don't know, you know, maybe it was a little bit provocative to call the book Real World Enlightenment. But um, I just, I think that sometimes in our Buddhist uh our Buddhist circles, we can um, we can get caught in a way that um, limits us. Yeah, totally, totally. No, no, and I th- I think if people sometimes provocation is great because like it, you know, well, it, it's either people are going to be provoked and not look further, or they're going to be uh-huh. provoked and be curious, right? And and actually, yeah. it will it will get them to enter. Yeah. Uh, a relationship with the with the book but it's, it's and it goes um, back oops sorry oh no i was just going to say it but i but i think the way when you actually describe it it's it's very appropriate you know the title yeah yeah, yeah it goes back to that conversation we had before about when you're writing or when you're teaching or when you're mentoring yeah. holding in mind who is the human being that is reading or receiving or on the other, you know, the other side of this, my first, well, my first serious meditation teacher was Ken McLeod and I studied with yeah. him for years. He's in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition and a wonderful, wonderful teacher. And then he had a couple of teachers uh, and one of them was Ruth Gilbert. And mm. I studied with her for a few years And that's when I started working with kids. And she gave me an instruction that I kept on a uh, little card that I I took a dulcimer to the classes so that I carry around in the dulcimer case. And it was serve the child in front of you now. Mm -hmm. And that was her instruction. And that uh, I really, you know, don't worry about anything other than who's in front of you and how can you best serve them. And that has had that, that instruction has stayed with me throughout my life. And I think in the same way, when you're writing or when you're teaching, yeah, you know, you don't write to the person who's going to think that, uh, you know, who's going to like be put off by the title. If you write to the person who's going to be intrigued by it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. And you, and you briefly mentioned something kind of I'm passionate about and, you know, I don't want to say too much because I, I, I can sound critical if I go too much into it. And I don't really want to do that. But um, I do, th- you know, I, I think once once these identities form around how serious of a Buddhist we are or or on the, the other extreme, like how anti and, you know, religious and secular and scientific we are, 
I don't know. I just see those as very problematic. And, you know, I'm interfacing a little bit more with the, you know, when, when people take themselves a little too serious, seriously as Buddhist practitioners. And I've taken myself way too seriously at points as that. And I, I just found it to be a, a, a large trap and actually kind of like, it actually like prevented some, you know, me on a personal level from, from deepening, you know, with, with that yeah. kind of mentality. And ironic, yeah. right? You yeah. know, because it's all ego. Yeah, you know, exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. here we are, you know, really trying to loosen the hold of ego through our practice. And uh, that that is what that is. And I know I have had it. I, I've had it in many different ways, shapes or forms. And I certainly have run across it in my in my professional and my practice life. Uh, but again, that's where the idea of playfulness and a sense of humor, um, and, you know, and empathy all, you know, really serve us well. And you mentioned we were talking about systems earlier. There's kind of one framework I see because, like, sometimes when we notice we're taking something too seriously, sometimes the tendency I, I see uh, in myself and others is to like then deconstruct it and sort of like become a maverick. And I realized, well, that's kind of another extreme too because we, you know, yeah. we have systems. Like to me, the you know the systems of traditional Buddhist lineages they're not broken. We just need to figure out how to access them. It's like what doors do we need to be able to access them? You know, yeah. make, make them alive for yeah. yeah yeah no i think you know everything is changing and and i think that again is where it helps uh to oh uh, you know if you if you're studying buddhism uh and and you really are interested in what's going on and and change uh, I would I would encourage people to be careful of the sangha you cho- choose to mm. join, um, but also to join a community or join a sangha because yeah. you know. And and I really want to emphasize: be careful, you know. Yeah. And and sometimes watch your wallet. You know, you got to <laughs> be careful with it. You know, because what you're doing is it's a very precious thing you're doing, joining a community and joining yeah. a sangha, and you want to make sure that uh you will be safe basically uh psychologically spiritually emotionally all that but once you do then what happens if you get into one of these songs and you stick around for a few years is you start to see it's just all people you know and whenever people come together we're, I'm talking about messiness a lot in this in this conversation, but things <laughs> get a little messy, and you know it's it's not like everything isn't all up on high, and uh, yeah. you just start to see it a little bit more clearly, and and then you can also see just how great these practices are, because I mean we we wouldn't do it if these things weren't actually transforming us. It's true. Yeah. And I think, I think as human beings, I always underestimate our bullshit meter. I think mo- for most of us, even like someone you wouldn't think had a strong one, most of us yeah. have a pretty high bullshit meter. And a lot of that is not through verbal communication, it's through other, you know, ways of perceiving. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And trusting that if we see the bullshit, other people do. That's been yeah. a problem I've had in some of these communities. <laughs> yeah. I'm sitting yeah. there, I'm seeing you know what the emperor has no clothes does nobody see this <laughs> and then i realize maybe it's a day later maybe it's a year later oh no you know the vast majority of people do realize it you know so yeah yeah i agree and 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 sometimes i've seen they just don't know what to do about it or there's a lot of fear so they hang on and they they become even more rigid you know yes. like i think yeah. that's just any ideology including political or, or yeah. whatever it seems yeah. like we yeah, when we when we fear losing a belief, we we become even more rigid with mm-hmm. with how we interact with it. Yeah, I think that's right. So if you're a student going into a community like that and it starts to feel that way, you can skillfully uh, kind of backpedal a little bit. Doesn't mean you have to get out of it entirely, but you can give it a little bit of space and watch. And it's all good. It's all good learning. Yeah, that's, that's excellent advice. I mean, we, I, that would be a wonderful conversation. I feel like it's actually really needed. A lot of people struggle with this because, I mean, obviously new people who are who really do want to study a, a, a lineage-based traditional form of Buddhism, they, 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 they struggle with where do I go? You know, how do I find a good teacher? How do I find a community? But even people in the communities, um, just like being in a family, we hit – uh, obstacles we hit difficulty and the sangha is there to work it work it through but like you said you first have to check them to make sure you yeah. want to work it through with those particular people you know? yeah 
That's yeah. right. That's right. That's a big one. Yeah. They, yeah, they think it's kind of, anyways, we'll leave that. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I mean, I think the only thing that I would want to say is that I think, you know, to rem- it's, it's hard to remember that we have agency in those things. Mm. Yeah. And also, really, you know, to get help if you need it. And yeah, to get totally. help outside the sangha. If something if something icky is going on, you know, it's certainly, it's really wise to get outside help if needed. Uh, and also to remember, you know, that, that we have agency in that, not that it's our fault that something icky is going on, but that we can backpedal our way out skillfully. Yeah, yeah. yeah when it comes to teachers, which is only... You know the, the the teacher is or teachers are only one part of the sangha, um, but um, I always recommend to people. It's like you, you you know I say look for a teacher who um, will help you to discover more agency, and if you're giving it away uh, because of your own trauma, they'll give it back mm-hmm. to you. You know, that's so beautiful. Like, yeah. So yeah. And, and and that doesn't mean they won't make mistakes. Every teacher will make mistakes. I mm-hmm. haven't met one who doesn't. Um, and, and actually for me, I mean, I'm not suggesting this for anyone else. For me, there's a lot of beauty to that because I can relate to them. You know, Mm -hmm. they're not, you know, this holy figure on a pedestal. They're actually in a human body and, you know, appear, screw ups appear to me sometimes. And actually I'm like, wow, I love it because I'm such a screw up. So I love, I love it. But of course, then, you know, we do have to, if those screw ups turn into taking, trying to. I don't know, hoard people's agency. That's a different thing. That's a different problem. Yeah. 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 Um, I really relate to what you said. That makes so much sense to me. Yeah. Yeah. Every teacher that I treasure in my life, they, you know, of course they're willing to give advice. They're willing to help support and give some direction, but they, they always leave it up to me and they, they never take responsibility for what I should be taking responsibility for, you know? Yeah. 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 Um, Susan, I, I would just, just as we kind of start to wrap up here, I would love to hear um, just anything we haven't chatted about. We chat about a lot. <laughs> uh, anything we, ha- we haven't chatted about, especially anything around your book you'd love to share, um, but it really could be anything. Yeah. No, I just, uh, I don't really have anything uh, specific, but I guess, you know, what's really been landing with me, especially, you know, there's a lot of noise out there right now and um, and a lot of discord and just this notion of really seeing if you can focus on the commonalities first before jumping to conclusions. And the more we can learn to hold back from jumping to conclusions, or if we jump to conclusions, fine, but don't shoot the second arrow, you know, and then, you know, keep reinforcing that conclusion. I think it's a very dangerous and a tricky time that we're living in right now. There's a lot of noise and there's a lot of, uh, a lot of disinformation being sent out. uh, And I think we really need to you know i would really encourage people not to give up and not to give up hope mm. uh but actually to be to use this as an opportunity to be hopeful and to practice some of these practices around you know doing the best you can but letting go your expectation for a particular outcome because that's one of the things that I am seeing with people I'm working with, people I'm talking to, and younger people, just the sense of it's just so bad out there. I just, what can I do? And what good will it do? And I don't know what good it'll do. Uh, but I will say just everyone going out there and putting the best energy they can without really hanging on to a particular outcome, that energy, I believe, will make a difference. And I just... That's that's the only last message I would say is that in this really difficult time that we don't give up hope and that we don't give up action, uh, and yet we still grow even more comfortable with the limits of our capacity to know what's going to happen next. Yeah, beautiful. Uh, yeah, that, I, I mean that message resonates me with resonates with me a lot. It's sort of like 
that is one of my North stars, <laughs> I guess is, you know, I don't, that's what the analogy is, but what you just said. Yeah. yeah I, I call it like love without expectation. Yeah. It's that's of, beautiful. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's challenging, but I, it's a worthy cause and intention. Yeah. Yeah. It's challenging. Yeah. Well, beautiful, Susan, thank you so much. And just for sharing your, um, not only your work and, and some wisdom from your new book, but just, just also, you know, who you are. I, I think people are going to get a lot out of this. So I just really appreciate your time. Oh. Yeah. Well, thank you. And thank you for doing this. I know it's a lot of work to put one of these podcasts up and I appreciate <laughs> you sending this good energy, this, this love out into the world. Yeah, no, it, it's a joy, especially because of these kinds of conversations. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, my dear, and, and all you out there. People I mean, people can get in touch with you through your website, uh, right? Yes. And, and I'll put it in the notes, but it, it's it's just SusanKaiserGreenland.com or .org? Yeah, just my name. Yeah. Okay. And then, then the book, Real World Enlightenment, they can, I'm assuming they can buy everywhere. <laughs> you can buy anywhere, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Shambhala has pretty good reach. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. So please, everyone, uh, get the book. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you again. This was fun. This was fun. Let's do it again. I would love That's to. That's great. Yeah. Okay, Susan. Take care. Thanks.